Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is on return to work and a look at how moments of change define normal. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive, and our webinar today is presented by R.D. Weiss. So now we'll get right, right into it. I'd like to introduce your speaker, Randy Weiss, who you see here on the screen. Uh, Randy is CEO and founder of R.D. Weiss, and he launched the company in 1990, leveraging extensive management experience with a major international company and key industry affiliations to build a highly successful full-service flooring maintenance company serving the commercial market. And among a complete range of floor maintenance services, R.D. Weiss was an early leader in the science and practice of disinfection, and in the past, disinfection was a key odor elimination strategy. Uh, and as we know now today, disinfection is a critical function for maintaining safe environments, uh, including in facilities. Right in. Well, welcome everyone. What I wanted to do today is bring a perspective to uh, what COVID is, has done to the workplace and how facility managers are coping with one aspect of it, which is really disinfection. Um, as Ann said, more than a dozen years ago, our company got into using disinfecting products primarily for odor remediation, but uh, we also, along the way, used it for things like MRSA, H1N1, swine flu, and other viruses that, uh, that came along in the workplace. But until COVID, there was nothing uh, before that created this kind of concern and uh, created uh, this kind of risk to the public. So when COVID uh, um, really hit the United States, we looked at uh, what part disinfection would play in the market and uh, began, uh, began down a course of trying to educate people and help people solve their, their problems. So my first slide, when it appears. Neil, I'm having trouble getting um, my cursor. There we go. So the first slide is really to bring to you a, um, a scale of the proportion of COVID-19 uh, and compare it to 9-11. So we all know how 9-11 changed our world. Previous to 9-11, we walked in and out of buildings um, uh, without any interference from anyone. We went through the airports without uh, security and scanning and all that. And after 9-11, our world changed. Now, the picture on the right is any airport in America. Uh, those are Homeland Security people. Prior to 9-11, there was no Homeland Security. And today, Homeland Security is 230,000 people who are protecting you every day. Um, I think that uh, the reason 9-11 is good to compare it to is most people in the workplace today remember that event and see how uh, it impacted their lives. Neil, you want to bring the next slide? Okay. So again, this is all about proportion now. This is for shock value. This is to give you something to talk in your own companies about to uh, raise the awareness with your employer. So COVID-19 kills over 900 US citizens a day. Now, that's like saying since this began, COVID-19 is equal to 75 9-11s, not one 9-11, 75 9-11s is the death count on COVID today. We saw what the response was with 9-11. I mentioned Homeland Security and all the protocols we went through. This is happening today slowly because so many companies have not brought people back to work yet. And they're still formulating their strategies and trying to figure out you know, what the best course is for them. Next slide. Again, just to keep in proportion, you've seen these uh, slides before. We're at 227,000 people and growing. 9-11, let's go back to that. Just under 2,000 people died. So we are, you know, many, many fold 
uh, past that. Next slide. I also think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, major loss to uh, U.S. citizens, you know, we always think of war and we worry about how war is going to affect our economy and how war is going to uh, affect our security. And this slide just shows, starting with the Afghanistan war with a uh, fatality rate of 2,372, Vietnam, uh, a a high water mark before COVID at 58,000 and COVID we're at uh, just about 230,000 and climbing. Next. So we all know how this has changed our world. Um, I could have just put a mask on as a screen and you would have all laughed and got it uh, because that's become part of your life. Washing your hands has become part of your life. Social distancing has become part of your life. Taking out food as opposed to picking up at, uh, or as opposed to going into a restaurant has become the new normal for some of us. And I think uh, we all have to recognize that uh, the new normal is gonna be the normal for a while. Next slide, please. So what needs to happen on the business front? We can't really affect a lot of what happens uh, with the hospitality industry, vacationing, and all these other things. We need to talk today and, and focus today on what business may do or needs to do. So if you were to go on uh, the website of any major company and you would go to their mission statement, you're most likely to read something like, our number one asset are our people is our people. Um, Harvard Business Review recently, Inc. Man Inc. Magazine recently, and LinkedIn recently all said that people, employees, are the most valuable asset of every uh, company. So if that's the case, we have to take this seriously. We have to protect our people the way buildings are being protected with new security protocols, and we have to treat them like any other asset um, in, in, our, in our business. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna move away from um, the bigger picture. I'm gonna start drilling down into some data, some facts, and uh, everything you will see and hear from us today is backed up by third-party um, third uh, research. So um, throughout uh, the pandemic, uh, we have hosted calls with clients. We've talked to um, um, many industry people about, um, about the role of disinfection. And there were many opinions. There were many ideas people have on what you need to do, what you can do, what you should do. Um, a very large company uh, six months ago told us that because they had closed their building on the weekend, they could open up on Monday without doing any disinfection because coronavirus only lives two days on a surface. Well, that's not what uh, third party sources say. So, you know, these surfaces are in all of your buildings metal, glass, ceramic, paper, wood, plastic. You can see how long the coronavirus lives on those surfaces. Because of that, um, we, have to treat, uh, we have to treat remediation as an ongoing, not a one-time event. Uh, people ask us all the time, how often do you have to do this? The answer is gonna be, it depends, and Ann and I will get into that a little bit later on. But these are the facts in terms of how long the virus is gonna live on your surface. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about terminology. I am not in the uh, janitorial business per se. We do specialized work uh, outside of the janitorial uh, segment. Cleaning, as you all know, is done primarily for aesthetics. You know, when the floor is clean, you don't think of it as disinfected. When your desktop is cleaned pre-COVID-19, you only noticed that that ring from your coffee cup was gone and you never thought about, is there something on my work surface that I can't see? 
So cleaning, while important, and while I believe cleaning will take on a larger emphasis going forward, it's not to address COVID-19. Sanitization. So sanitization is uh, often used interchangeably with disinfection. The true defini definition of sanitization is that when you sanitize something, you are reducing the germ and viral count. You're not eliminating it, you're reducing it. I'm not saying sanitization is not something that has its place, but in terms of COVID-19, the EPA says the only way to get rid of COVID-19 is disinfection. Now, let me throw another uh, statistic out. Um, if you buy a disinfectant in uh, your grocery store or sanitizer, uh, it's very confusing. There's a lot of a lot of claims on labels, and you may see something labeled, you know, that this is a disinfectant. It might say it kills 99.9% of the germs. Well, 99.9% .9 of the germs can be uh, eradicated by washing your hands with soap and water. That's 99.9%. To, to be a disinfectant, you have to be 99.39s, nine, nine, nine. So when you see Lysol or, um, or another product that might say 99.9, .9, that sounds really good, but it's not any different than washing your hands. So disinfection is how you treat COVID-19. Cleaning is part of it. You have to clean first and start off with a clean surface before you uh, disinfect. And sanitization, um, it's still a good thing to do uh, in certain cases, but it is not something that is going to um, work against COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this slide shows workers uh, disinfecting different kinds of space. Uh, you've got a childcare center, you've got a lobby, you've got a factory. The one common denominator of this is all of these, all of these people are wearing CDC recommended personal protective equipment, which means for disinfection, a Tyvek suit like you see in the photos, a hood for protecting their hair and as much skin as possible, goggles or a shield, a face mask, rubber gloves, booties. So if someone is coming into your facility to disinfect, this is what they need to look like. And the reason they need to look like this is when you walk in a building, you do not know whether there has been a positive case or not. And, and, and your better qualified service companies are going to assume that every building has a positive case. Because let's go back to what I said earlier. You know, Fortune 500 companies say that their uh, employees are the most valuable asset. Well, in our company, we say the same thing. So we don't want our company, we don't want our employees uh, being put at risk uh, when they go in to do work in, in other buildings. And did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to ask about uh, the, the types of facilities that RD Weiss uh, does work with. You're showing a variety here. And I actually wanted to ask you uh, just a little bit more to explain before we get into the, the meat of our questions, you know, what, what your company does in terms of what types of facilities you work in and, um, you know, that kind of thing, just to, to get a, a broader sense based on these photos. Sure. sure. Um, uh, mo most of the work we do is in uh, the corporate office environment. Um, so let's start there. It's your typical cubicle farm building, multi-floor tenant, et cetera. That could be one type. Um, bank branches uh, would be another type where you've got the public coming in every day. You don't know where they've been who they've been with, hopefully they're wearing a mask, but uh, facilities like that that have almost an uncontrollable level of uh, people coming in from the outside become a good target 
for high frequency disinfection. Uh, the New York City subways. Uh, one of the questions I get asked all the time is how often should I disinfect my space? And the answer is, you know, it, it depends on the space. It depends on are you taking people's temperatures when they walk in the door and having them fill out a form that they feel well and all of that. In a subway, you can't do that. You cannot take everyone's temperature when they get in the subway. So the subway system of New York City, they disinfect every day, every car. And that's the best they can really uh, do at this time. Um, and then lastly, essential businesses outside of healthcare. Healthcare usually has their own in-house protocols. And look, they've been disinfecting for years. You know, hospitals, nursing homes, they understand better than any of us the importance of keeping viruses out of the, the space. But when I talk about other essential businesses, I'm talking about phone companies, utility companies. You know, the last thing you need in a large city is for the grid to collapse because of an outbreak of COVID and everybody's got to be quarantined. So utility companies, those kind of essential businesses have a very, very high um, appreciation for keeping employees safe and keeping their businesses running. Okay, thank you. Okay, Neil, next question, please. Next slide. So, you know, your disinfection strategy is going to be defined a lot by your environment. So, in this photograph, we've got a uh, we've got a, a train station, we've got a school, we've got an operating room, and we have an outside uh, arena. Uh, there are many ways to apply disinfectants, and I'll, I would assume that many of our listeners have heard that you can fog the space or you can use an electrostatic sprayer or you can even use a hand sprayer like a you know a windex bottle and all of those have uh an application in 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 certain areas for example in a train station you need something that can um broadcast a maximum amount of disinfectant you don't have to target it very well uh, because you've got such a large space to deal with. On the other hand, the operating room below, um, probably more important in there than whether or not you hand wipe or use sprayers, is going to be, are you using a product that is safe for people and equipment? There are 500 approved disinfectants on the EPA's end list. And if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with that, the end list is the list that uh, the EPA um, has all the products that they will uh, endorse for killing COVID-19. Not all those products would be safe to use in an operating room because they, they're, they're, they're engineered for different kinds of applications. So, for example, if one had a high level of uh, corrosivity to it, like hydrogen peroxide. Peroxide is a terrific disinfectant, but it also uh, has oxidizing properties. I don't think you'd want to use it in a room with expensive medical equipment and run the risk of that interfering with uh, medical procedures or medical testing. Same way on the upper right-hand corner in a school. Again, some products kill the virus, but have side effects. The Wall Street Journal on October 1st published in the travel section a little article about what one airline was doing for disinfecting their planes to make the passengers feel better. The product they used, and this wasn't me, this was the, the author of the article, pointed out that in, uh, increased inhalation of this product could cause lung damage. So in a school, you'd want to avoid a product like that. You wouldn't want a product in the air that had any health hazards associated with it. But if I'm doing, and I don't know what stadium that is uh, in, the, in the photograph, but if I'm doing an outdoor arena or a stadium, 
it's not going to matter a whole lot what product they use because uh, it's it's not going to remain in the air. It's going to be targeted for the item I'm disinfecting, and I don't have to worry about people breathing a vapor or a fog when we're all done. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're talking all of, we're talking mainly about disinfection. We start out. We also talked about cleaning, and when companies bring their teams back to work, uh, I get asked all the time, "What do you recommend we do on day one?" Well, this is sort of what we recommend people do on day one. Don't just clean um, work surfaces and door handles. Don't just fog the building one time. Bring your people back with the maximum uh, assurances that everything that possibly could be done was done by the company. And that would be, you know, clean the carpet one more time before you bring people back. Clean all the upholstery and panel fabric in the facility one more time. Clean and seal the bathroom tile grout. Grout is porous. Bacteria likes to live in porous grout. Um, a virus will attach to porous grout differently than if it's sealed. And after you've taken all those steps, you should disinfect the space using either an electrostatic spray system, which you know completely fills the air and and covers all of the surfaces and and furniture and so forth, or a fogging system that can um, achieve the same result. So it's one, two, three, four, go. Oh, yes. Sorry, you just mentioned the the uh, for the disinfection, uh, the yellow step there at the end, um, and an uh, electrostatic sprayer as a an option there. So for could you talk a little bit about uh, how panel and upholstery, the tile and grout, carpet care, would it also be as far as you're concerned with your company, is an electrostatic sprayer being used there, or is that more of a spray and wipe process, or how does that work? So um, we would um, electrostatically spray the entire area. That would okay. be our final step. And we would probably um, we would probably hand wipe the high touch areas. In other words, doorknobs, push panels on doors, anything like that that's high touch. We would clean it first and then disinfect it again. So one other thing, uh, as you watch. Uh, people in your building cleaning and disinfecting. In your home, most people, if they're cleaning a countertop, they spray it, and hopefully today they're using some kind of disinfectant. They spray it, it's wet, and they wipe it off. It's almost like one, two, three. For disinfectant to work, it has to sit and stay wet. And most disinfectants, it's five to 10 minutes. So if I spray a room, I need to not go back and wipe any residue off for five to 10 minutes. Otherwise, it's, I'm defeating the purpose of it. Next slide. OK, well, we're still in the infancy of, uh, of COVID. And I do think that uh, innovation is going to drive change. You know, the first thing we're all waiting on is a vaccine. A vaccine is probably going to shorten up the window uh, on how much disinfection you have to do, how often you have to do it, because at some point in time, hopefully, our population will be immune to COVID-19. On the block on the right, where I talk about chemistry, uh, today's chemistries um, kill the virus, but they do not have a very long-lasting effect. So if I spray your space today and two days later, someone comes in and is infected, it could reinfect the space. There are products, they are known as persistent kill products that are trying to get out of the lab and through testing with uh, the EPA that will offer longer term um, viral kill. So you could put it on and it might last 30 days. There's one product that is, uh, they believe that 
it will work up to 90 days. But those products aren't here yet, but that innovation is going to change the disinfection game a little bit. Lastly is technology. So most people are familiar with ultraviolet light. Uh, ultraviolet light will kill the virus. Um, there are robots that in a small room, like an operating room, can go in, be turned on, and the ultraviolet light will kill the virus. The problem is those robots are, you would need a lot of them in a, in a hospital, and they're fairly expensive. They're a large capital investment, and they're not real flexible. I couldn't go in the subway system with a robot that, that required um, electric to, to run on. But there is technology now, in fact, there's a hospital in Stanford, Connecticut that in their new addition, they put in their HVAC system, a UV, a uh, new type of UV called UVC. They put this in their system so that every time there's an air change, the UV is cleaning the air. So I think those technologies will, will find their way here and they will uh, bring, uh, I think, a new level of new level of comfort and uh, assuredness to, uh, to people. Next slide. So I like this one a lot. Um, I talked to a client some time ago and uh, they told me that their exterminator had just gotten into the disinfection business. And, um, and I said, uh, uh, how long have they been doing it? Well, they just got into business. And, uh, and there are many other companies, painting companies, et cetera, that have joined um, uh, the disinfection arena. Um, my advice here is um, uh, just do your homework. Find out, I'm not saying that all these companies um, uh, should be neglected. I'm saying do your homework. Think about the, that the stop before your building might have been spraying for bugs with a pesticide and then that same equipment is brought into your building to um, do disinfection. It may not be the same thing as a true specialist in disinfection. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, that's the, uh, the end of the slide deck and the formal presentation and um, first of all, thank you again for giving uh, us this opportunity to address the audience, and um, and I'll take any uh, questions that uh, you have or uh, you have from the audience. Okay, great, thanks. I'm going to uh, dive into a few about uh, your just expanding a little bit on your experience with clients to date uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, and then I do want to get into some more of the technical aspects, talking about cleaning and disinfection a little bit. So uh, one of the questions, I'll piggyback them together, is, uh, you know, some in our audience must be wondering what other firms are doing with disinfection currently. You mentioned the subway system uh, at one point. I'm wondering, can you offer any examples, uh, without naming names, of what other clients are doing around disinfection in terms of whether it be frequency, um, things that they've changed, and Piggybacking on that, maybe, what are some some of the common questions, requests um, that you're hearing from clients that they're just you know unsure about as as COVID has has been around with in terms of disinfection? Um, uh, great question. Let me uh, try and take it apart. So, yeah. the one response that's easy to answer is when a client calls and says, "I have a positive COVID case. We have somebody in the building." He, works, he or she works in a specific department and we just found out they have COVID. Uh, when that happens, the response is immediate. How soon can you get there? How soon can you disinfect the space? Because when the employees find out that they've got a positive coworker, they wanna go home. And they don't wanna come back until they know that some remedial action has been taken by the company. So that one is real simple. Um, positive case, immediate action, get the employees back to the workplace as fast as possible. For the routine, um, you know, for the routine client, I would have to say that I mentioned subways every day, I mentioned utility companies um, weekly, if not more often. 
Um, I would say that the average corporate office is probably going to disinfect um, with hand wiping daily. So the janitors are going to hand wipe daily as part of their protocol. And then to do the comprehensive um, electrostatic disinfection, that, that will probably be, be a bi-monthly or monthly activity. It's not going to go away. It's, it's, it's all wrapped up in um, employee relations message. It's all wrapped up in keeping morale high in the company. And it's wrapped up in risk management. I mean, if all your people are quarantined, you might have a serious problem depending on your, your business. Um, I think this is still very much being sorted out by, um, um, by facility managers. You know, I don't, they don't have a clear roadmap and they're all trying desperately to figure out how to put this together. So. Okay, great, thank you. I do want to um, put up two polls that we had prepared before we move forward. Uh, I wanted to pose two questions, one after the other to you out in the audience. Uh, just a, a general question, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, where you're at with your uh, planning and kind of your perspective these days. So if you can take a look at this and just select, we'll show the results and then we'll have an COVID-19 pandemic drive long-term health safety requirements in the same way the 9-11 drove enhanced security requirements. What do you think as far as the long-term? We will show the results in a moment or two. Okay, so yes, 90% uh, do, do believe that it, this is going to be a, a long-term thing and that's no, not really a surprise to me personally. So thank you uh, all for sharing. Um, the next question uh, is more about your your own uh, organization and your team. Uh, so has your organization communicated a clear, well-defined return to work plan with your employees and partners at this point? Um, or, or if no, are you still putting that together? Okay. So yes, 71%, that's, uh, that's good to hear. So Randy, you see those results as well, um, which could help as well. Thank you, everyone. So I do wanna jump back to some questions. Uh, let's see, jump back to some audience questions as well as some of the ones that I have here. Um, Randy, let's, let's get into, you had talked a, a bit about disinfection, the terms that are in the industry. Um, there may be some confusion depending on people's experiences. So I, I just wanna back up a little bit, make sure we cover that. Uh, can we talk just a little bit more about what terms should facility executives understand for disinfecting facilities, cleaning, sanitization, and disinfection? Um, I'm wondering with your talk about sanitization there, is that something that um, in today's environment, do we need to do all three steps? Uh, is cleaning and disinfection enough or, or how do you approach that? So I think you take sanitization out of it. I think sanitization might fit back in when COVID is no longer and you don't have to go to that third step. Um, for reasons I mentioned before, there are 500 disinfectants. Some of them are safe to use around people. Uh, you don't even need protective equipment and others burn your eyes, they burn your throat, et cetera. Um, I think that uh, disinfection needs to be kept in a place for now to deal with the virus and down the road, you know, a sanitization step, which is less, uh, I don't wanna use the word toxic, but not as strong, uh, mm -hmm. I think I think works fine. Okay, okay, so then let's talk about uh, what is an effective cleaning and disinfection process. And along those lines too, we had a question of, uh, what is the way, what is a way in your experience to verify the effectiveness of surface cleaning? Is that something that uh, you know you all touch upon as well? So what's the effect of cleaning disinfection, generally speaking, and then how is that um, you know, facilities people, of course, need to try to verify that your customers want to know that they're you know, getting effectiveness. So how does that fit in? So that's, that, that's a great question. 
uh, and and one that uh, I don't hear very many people talking about, and they and they should. So I believe in, um, as I said early in in the presentation, I believe in things being third party. I believe that children who grade their own papers always will get an A. So if my job is to disinfect, I shouldn't be the guy grading my work. There are third party organizations that can um, um, sell to a company a very simple swab that comes in a test tube and they could follow us the day after disinfection. They could check high test, high touch areas and get a, a test result themselves. Um, I don't hear many people talking about that. And that's a great question, by the way, because that gets back to, you know, the, uh, uh, the swell of people that have jumped into the disinfection business. You know, they may or may not all be the same in terms of training, in terms of equipment, even in terms of chemistry. And once you spend the money and you, you know, assured your workforce that uh, they're in a safe environment, you should really make sure that, you know, what you did is working. So not many people are talking about that, but it's available. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the, the products themselves. Um, you mentioned the US EPA's list in of uh, disinfectants for coronavirus, and I'm guessing that many in the audience are familiar or at least aware of it at this point in time. Uh, so, you know, it currently lists about five, or maybe five, exactly 500 products at this point. Um, so how do you evaluate those? You talked about he balancing health, balancing the impact on assets in the facility. Uh, so how are these evaluated by a service provider, such as yourself, um, to determine the best choices for the facilities being serviced? Uh, um, I mean, there's that, that huge list. Um, you know, you're obviously an expert, but so what are some ways that you balance out and evaluate what's best for the job? So uh, many on this call are familiar with the old material safety data sheet, which is now just called safety data sheet. Mm -hmm. It is the, um, uh, the company's filing with the EPA that points out, among other things, all of the risks associated with the product. All 500 products will kill COVID, but some of them are gonna have a, uh, there's a four part health hazard rating system. You know, what does it do to your eyes? What does it do to your lungs? What does it do to your skin? And, and we, have, we have really uh, narrowed down our choice to things that have a very low impact on skin or well on people very low impact on interior finishes. You know, there are products that are uh, uh, chlorine based that uh, will again, effectively get rid of COVID, but if you get it on a cotton fabric repeatedly, it bleaches it out. So the good news is you killed the COVID. The bad news is all your furniture is white in your workspace. So we've tried to find something that would meet along the way, uh, check all the boxes, for people, furnishes, furnishings, plants, et cetera. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna stay on that product uh, topic for a moment because we had a, a, two questions come in. Um, how effective are common household items, uh, products such as Clorox, Lysol, uh, maybe Microban, the Microban specifically, I don't know if you, you wanna address that, but Microban specifically is touted as being effective for 24 hours after application. So if there's any of those household items you wanna comment on, I know you mentioned the 99.9% .9 off the shelf claims. Right. Um, I'll start then, with Microban. Sure. Ahead. No, go I'll ahead. Start, I'll start with Microban. It's been around for a long time. Microban um, is not a disinfectant. Um, microban is, um, is good to prevent the growth of bacteria and germs. Bacteria and viruses, two different things. Um, microban probably says in its literature that it could be effective against the prevention of um, COVID or the transmission of COVID. But the key word's gonna be could be. Uh, it, Microban is an antimicrobial. Now I'm gonna introduce yet another category, 
sanitize, disinfect antimicrobial. Antimicrobial is, is, is to go up against bacteria. COVID-19 is not a bacteria. I mentioned um, chemistry as moving in a direction towards long-term kill. I do believe products like Microban will re-engineer themselves to do both provide both the longer term protection and um, the immediate response to COVID that it needs to. Um, Lysol and Clorox, I happen to know Clorox has a product called 360 uh, and Clorox has got a great brand name. Uh, everyone recognizes it. Um, and 360 is on the uh, EPA N list, N is in Nancy. I do not know about Lysol, but the key indicator when you pick something up in the store is it's got to be 99 point and then three nines, not one nine, not two, but three nines. If it says 99.3 nines, then it's, uh, it's an effective product. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the other question is, there was um, a question specifically about a, a, a gen generic product. Uh, it says, we've been using denatured alcohol. Is this effective? Do you have any view on that? Um, I don't know specifically about uh, denatured alcohol. My 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 assumption is that it, it probably is. Again, I would go to the EPA endless. Peroxide is on the list. Um, look, there were um, um, there were distilleries in the U.S. You know who looked at switching from making uh, spirits to a high percentage alcohol to um, um, you know. Kind of getting the disinfectant, but you know Jack Daniel's disinfectant, if you will. Um, so um, again, I would go to the end list and look. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably okay. Now, one thing too, just to talk about some of these products, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned you know our selection of product has to hit several markers: skin, eyes, plants, people, etc. The last one is VOCs. You know. Is it going to smell like bleach when I leave your space? Mm -hmm. And we've selected a product that is minimal to zero VOC. Um, so that that's that's another thing to consider, I think, when you're looking at uh, products. I mean, Lysol, uh, you walk into a bathroom, it's been cleaned with Lysol, and right away, you know it's been cleaned because you smell the Lysol. I don't know that that would be appropriate in a broad spectrum fashion in a workplace because of the odor. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I'm I'm going to lead into uh, what's the most common mistake you see in facility disinfection programs? Can you talk a little bit about that in your experience? Uh, COVID obviously is the the focus here, but uh, if you have any other insights on disinfection and maybe some mistakes that you're seeing facilities people do. Um, whether it's, well, I'll leave it at that. You know, first of all, I don't think facility, I used to be a facilities manager, so I'll, uh, I should clarify that. I don't think facility managers um, intentionally make any mistakes. I think at times they are so busy, and they've got such a wide variety of initiatives they're working on, they rely on others for information. You know, they might rely on me for information, they might rely on the janitors that they see every day who say, by the way, we can also provide disinfection services. Um, so if you were asking, or you did ask, what's the biggest common mistake that I see? It's that people don't do the enough diligence. It's they're busy, they take something for granted, they don't do enough diligence. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna lead the other way. and. Um... You know, that's I'm sure why many people are on this call today and what they've been working to do you know in the past months um, in addition to, to you know life at, before COVID. Uh, so I want to ask you if you had if you had to point to one thing as being key to a successful disinfection program. I mean you mentioned due diligence of course, uh, but what would it be? And, and maybe I'm going more toward um, you know the actual practical aspects of it. What would be a specific key? Whether it's you know scheduling it, um, questions to ask, that kind of thing. I think I would, because there's so much data out there, there's so many opinions, I would go, I'm going to hold something up, 
OSHA publishes the guide called Returning to Work. You can go online, it's 25 pages long. This, if, if, if I were a facility manager, this would be my Bible. And you can, you can just Google OSHA guidance on returning to work. And it is a complete plan from uh, how to set up your schedule of, you know, how many people you bring in on day one versus uh, day 100, how to separate desks, the importance of panels, uh, all the protocols, well, many protocols beyond what I've talked about, but certainly all the protocols I did talk about are in this OSHA guide. There is another, um, and I'm sure there are many more, but uh, Gensler Architects has done a great job in talking about um, um, how to cope with COVID when you return to work. And they uh, have a document, again, Google Gensler, 10 considerations for transitioning to the workplace, 10 items. It's very simple. I wouldn't try and reinvent the wheel. There's some pretty good stuff out there today. You don't have to do that. Uh, no one's gonna argue with you if you implement the OSHA plan. In fact, you'll probably get a, probably get a gold star. Okay, thank you. That's good practical uh, direction, thanks. So then we have a question came in. Uh, it says, we wipe down the door handles, sales counter, sneeze guards, and any other touch points after every customer interaction. Um, you know, I'm not sure what, what facility type this is. It didn't come in, but I'm thinking of when I go to um, you know, a, a department store that, that happens often uh, these days where it's wiped down before I even get to step up. Um, but perhaps this is a bank, I'm not sure. But the question is, uh, you know, doing that whole process before every customer, is this overkill? Uh, we only allow one client at a time in our facility. So it might not be retail. <laughs> so um, two things. I think it is a great business statement to make, regardless of whether it's retail or banking or, or whatever it is. I think it's a really great statement to show your customer, your employees, how important they are, and you're doing everything you can to protect them. The only thing I would probably add to that is that there is a tendency when there's high frequency cleaning to spray it and want to wipe it. Because, you know, if you're spraying a countertop in a bank where somebody fills out their uh, check deposit slip, if people do that anymore, mm -hmm. um, it probably needs to stay wet for up to five minutes. It depends on the material you're using. Uh, but I would also say that doing something, which it sounds like this, uh, this person uh, is doing is certainly better than doing nothing. But the best practice would be find out what the dwell time is that uh, the disinfectant you're using and let it sit and ask people not to use that area until, you know, your egg timer goes off or how are you watching uh, the time and then wipe it off. Thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you about another specific area of the facility that you had had on your uh, your chart with the four piece puzzle pieces, and that's carpets. Uh, yes. And some talking about uh, just you know carpet carpet cleaning in general. I think I asked you a little bit about what the process is. Do you use electric static spray electrostatic spraying for carpets? Uh, what is your recommendation there? So um, you you notice on that earlier slide where it said how long. Um, the virus lives on um, metal and plastic and glass, et cetera. You didn't see carpet on there. Um, the virus has a pretty short life on carpet. So, um, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the carpet cleaning part of it is somewhat preventative, but it's also to make sure that uh, you've you've done the maximum job you can in getting the space space ready but the electrostatic spraying of course it it goes and finds its way to every surface and that would include the carpet okay and can you talk about that just a bit the electrostatic spraying i know we, we've heard a lot about that um lately in the industry and, and before COVID as well can you just kind of walk us through that in terms of you mentioned uh, bi-monthly, monthly frequency, depending on you know the um, facilities' needs, et cetera? Can you just kind of quickly walk me through you know the evaluation process that you put into that for a customer? 
So um, almost all customers are a good fit for electrostatic spraying. Okay. Uh, the um, uh, the fog, if you will, is elect uh, electrically charged. So instead of falling to the ground in a gravity sense and settling like fog would, if we fogged the room, it would all it would find a surface and just go to the ground. The electrostatic spray is going to go to the walls, the ceiling, everything. Um, and that's the most complete system out there. And I think, you know, none of the professionals would argue with that. We, however, if we were doing your server room where all your computers are, mm -hmm. we would be concerned that computers have fans that run to cool the hard drives. We would be concerned about introducing any kind of disinfectant into your computer systems. So I would stay away from certain kind of equipment with electrostatic spraying, and I might approach it in a different way, where I could have more control over the disinfectant. Once the electrostatic comes out, I can't control it. A foggy mm -hmm. machine is point and shoot. I have a lot of control. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have time for, let's see, one more question. I appreciate everyone sending their questions in. Uh, I guess the, the question I want to ask is, uh, you know, we're talking about the service that you, that you provide, and uh, let's talk about uh, you know, in-house facilities cleaning teams. So can a facility management crew, you talked about healthcare having their own protocol, that's a, kind of a separate animal sometimes, but can a facility management crew simply buy and apply products? I mean, that's what many are doing out there in the absence of hiring service providers. What do you, um, you know, what's the, I guess the learning curve there or what you're seeing as a potential risk? With that so obviously my bias is in favor of hiring um, a professional but not just that I'm my bias is also that it's third party okay it's not your employees who might mm -hmm. do it wrong or might not do it at all mm -hmm. and you have a problem now you've got yourself to blame I think when you outsource it you've got that third party uh wall there for liability purposes that you don't have when you do it yourself i'll give you a, a practical example a um, medical center um, a, a doctor reached out to me months ago and said why can't i do this myself and i said you can i said how much more money do you want to spend on liability insurance for malpractice i said did you talk to your insurance company to see if you're even covered to do disinfection work in your office? And are your patients and your staff, are they gonna say, wait a minute, we do, we do surgery here, that's what we know how to do. Uh, and we've got the receptionist running around with a sprayer, that doesn't give us a lot of confidence. When they had their first positive case, they called us and I said, what happened to your spray equipment that you bought? And he said, you know, after we thought about it, the risk of doing it wrong and not having a third party there was too great for us. I'm not saying that's the answer in every business, but I do think businesses, you know, before they buy that equipment to do it yourself, talk to your own risk management department, talk to your own insurance department and see how they feel about you getting in the COVID uh, business. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry. Sorry. You may not get a green light. Understood. So uh, I want to thank you, Randy. Uh, we're going to wrap it up with that. Uh, I want to thank you very much for the presentation, for the insight, and uh, for your time today. And thank you. It's my pleasure. And uh, look forward to um, doing this again. Yes, thank definitely. You. Thank you. And of course, uh, thanks everyone out in the audience. Thanks for your questions and your attention. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we, you will receive a post-webinar email from us, and uh, also the recording will be available um, in the near future on facilityexecutive.com, and you can also check out Randy's company's website, RG Weiss, and that's rgweiss.com, as well as the additional information here on the screen. So thank you so much again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.